Hello, and welcome to this clip going through one of the questions on uh, the June 2011 Cambridge Chemistry Challenge Lower 6 paper. Um, I would point out that this isn't a mark scheme, uh, it's literally just my interpretation of how to go through the questions. So as with any um, C3L6 paper, the thing to remember is what they give you in the box. So as you might expect, any paper with challenge in the name is meant to be quite hard. But if you can get your head past that fact, um, and accept there's a little bit of thinking and application required, it should be possible to, to deduce your way through it. So when they talk about um, an appropriate number of significant figures and giving the correct units, you need to give the correct unit conversions, and uh, when they talk about appropriate significant figures, they mean the least sensitive from the data in the question. So let's say the least sensitive number of significant figures is three, your answer should be two, three significant figures. Okay, so let's uh, crack on with the question. So before we do that, let's have a quick look at the periodic table that's provided with the paper. Every single um, Cambridge Chemistry Challenge paper will have a periodic table, and they might have values for a, a relative atomic mass, for example, that are slightly different from the ones that you're used to. It's not that it's incorrect, it's maybe to a slightly higher level of precision. Um, generally, the exam boards tend to use one decimal place, and as you can see from all of the values here, there are two decimal places. The calculations in the paper will expect you to use the values from this periodic table, not the ones from your own exam board. So let's say you happen to remember from your own exam board that chlorine is 35.5, and on this one it's clearly 35.45, you need to use 35.45 not the one from your exam board, which is probably 35.5. So looking at question one, um, this was the very first C3L6 paper, so they're actually using molecules with the formula C3L6. So just taking you through what they're saying, basically L is sometimes used in chemistry when we look at reactions which compare compounds with normal hydrogen, so the isotope 1H, with those containing deuterium, the isotope 2H. So just to reconnect with the basics of isotopes, uh, 1H has one proton only, this is normal hydrogen that we know and love in our chemistry lessons, and uh, deuterium, or 2H, contains one proton and one neutron. If you are a second year and you're looking back on this, you might have come across NMR, uh, and you might have come across D2O, where deuterium oxide, or heavy water, is used as a uh, as a solvent. Okay, so coming on to the question itself. So you'll find that every opening question or question section in a C3L6 paper will be nice and easy to get you started. So it says two com compounds with the formula C3H6 and uh, give their names and the particular class of compounds each belongs to. So taking the way that we do um, uh, general formulae in organic chemistry. As always, you let N equals the number of C atoms. So your general formula would be CnH2n. So this could be either an alkene called um, propene or a cycloalkane called cyclopropane. So the next part again is quite accessible. Um, it asks you about one of the two isomers. Uh, it's going to call it isomer A. Now, we've already worked out that one of the isomers is propene, one is cyclopropane. It says that isomer A reacts rapidly with bromine to form a single product. So, obviously, this is about an addition reaction, electrophilic addition, I'm sure you'll realise. Um, and the electrophilic addition of alkenes with bromine. So, what they want to do um, is, uh, what you want you to do, rather, is the structure for A and the product form when it reacts with bromine. So it's as easy as anything just to put the equation down that you've learnt about in your A-level lessons or from textbooks. Okay, so it starts talking about the second isomer of C3H6. And what it says here is that uh, this particular isomer has a number of unique properties. And the other members in the same class of compounds only react with bromine in the presence of light and form HBr as a side product. So it's not an addition reaction in the same sense that we've just looked at. And it says that B reacts with bromine in the presence of light, 
but much less rapidly than A and forms a single compound, G. F and G are isomers. So that means you can deduce that F and G would share the same molecular formula. So taking that logic forward, you can work out that um, product F and product G are both C3H6Br2. So looking at part D, part 1, it says give the equation for the complete combustion of C3H6. So because it says complete combustion, I know that I'm going to make CO2 and not CO or C. You'll notice I've left spaces for the balancing numbers um, in front of O2, CO2 and H2O because I haven't started working it out yet. So now I've put my framework in place, I can start thinking about what those balancing numbers might be. So I have three carbons in C386 and I have uh, six hydrogens, so that would give me three CO2 and three H2O. So if I count up the number of oxygens on the right hand side, it becomes obvious quite soon that I've got nine oxygens. That would mean I need four and a half oxygen molecules on the left hand side to balance this out, which I can put in like that. Okay, so the next thing we wanted to do is to work out the standard enthalpy of formation of A. Now we've got some data here, it's combustion data, so I'm going to leave that equation there and use that for a Hess cycle. So using my constituent elements in their standard states, as per the standard enthalpy of formation definition you can find in any textbook, this is the standard way in which to put together a Hess's law cycle. And because I'm trying to calculate the enthalpy of formation, my arrows need to point from my elements to the compounds I'm trying to form. So I put in a little dotted line to remind myself of the direction of the reaction from the previous question, in other words, the combustion. So once I've done that, it's obvious that actually what I need to work out is the arrow going to the top left, pointing towards C386. So if I do an indirect route starting at my elements and ending up at C386, that allows me to produce a calculation that uh, gives us plus 152.1 kilojoules per mole to the minus 1. Now, the next part of the question is exactly the same idea, except I need to sub in the value for the enthalpy of combustion of B from the table. So I've changed uh, minus 2058 for minus 2091. So following exactly the same technique, this time it gets us to plus 185.1 kilojoules per mole to the minus 1. For the final part on this page, it says gaseous B needs to be stored carefully since it can convert explosively to the elements to isomer A or to other hydrocarbons. And they want you to calculate the standard enthalpy change for the reaction B to A. So this can be worked out by the difference between the two enthalpies. It's important to get in the right way round. Um, so if you're going from B to A, it's the formation enthalpy of A minus the formation enthalpy of B. So the logic behind this is it's the simple equation of the enthalpy of formation of the products take away the enthalpy of formation of the reactants, which gives us minus 33 kilojoules per mole. So in the next part of the question, you're suddenly given quite a lot of information. So I'm going to take a moment to, to talk you through this. Not so much the actual technicality of the, of the information for this question, but the reasoning behind why they've given you so much information all of a sudden. It's because this signifies a, a step up in the challenge of the paper. So you'll find this on C3L6 papers. Um, when you get to the second part of the question, not part B, part part C, but the, the second section of a question. So you might do A, B, C, D, E, for example, and it'll be quite easy. Straightforward A-level stuff like we've just done. This bit takes you a little bit beyond. So you need to be able to think about this using the information they give you. So I'm going to leave it um, highlighted in red to allow you to do that. So like it says in the information, when we draw a skeletal formula, we don't normally put in hydrogens. So that's what A would look like with all the hydrogens as normal hydrogens, e.g. hydrogens with one proton in the nucleus only. 
So what the question is asking you to do is to visualise all the different positions one deuterium atom could be placed. So don't forget that in the context of this question, D and H are different from each other. So this brings in EZ isomerism, so you've got four different possible structures. So for B, the difference here is it's a cyclic compound. So moving one D atom around doesn't create different isomers. In other words, it doesn't matter where you put the, the, the D atom, it's the same isomer. So let's move on to the next part of the question then. So in part G, um, we're looking at two deuterium atoms added to one molecule of A. So the number of possible structures increases. So I've put in a uh, displayed formula of molecule A so we can sort of keep track of which parts of it are H and which parts of it are D. So I'm going to take you through the various possibilities. And what you need to look out for for this question is the structure where the deuterium atoms are in the same chemical environment. So it can be clearly seen that here the deuteriums are in two separate environments. This isn't the structure we're looking for. So it's not this position either, because at first glance, although it might look like they're in a similar position, one's on the top part of the C double bond C, the other one's on the bottom part of the C double bond C. It's not this one either. Nor is it this one, where the H could be on uh, any of the positions on the CH3. But the CH3 environment offers three positions at the same time for D to occupy. So this now gives us structure A1. So before I move on to the next part of the question, um, I'm going to copy, or cut and paste the, that little bit at the bottom um, onto the next screen, because you'll need to use this to help you with your thinking. So, um, moving on to this next part, I've uh, taken uh, some of the information uh, from the previous screen, popped it up in the top right-hand corner of the screen for you here, and I'll refer to it as we go through. So I'm just going to take a moment to talk you through enantiomers. It does explain on the um, information above uh, where I've placed the word enantiomers, what they actually are. But basically, it's a carbon atom with four different substituents attached. Now the important thing to remember is that these are non-superimposable mirror images. Um, you're not able to stack them on top of each other like chairs or like... If you put, take your hands and try and stack one on top of the other, you can see that the thumb ends up on opposite sides, so it, it doesn't quite work. So if you look at this picture of my hands, I had a colleague kindly take a snap for me, um, you can see that they can't superimpose one on top of the other. You can try it with your hands as well, it just doesn't work. So um, the idea of non-superimposable images is important to remember when you're visualising an antiomers. So, uh, looking at the question, so looking at part H, the first bit, it says um, that uh, A1 gives a pair of enantiomers X1 and X2. Now, what they mean is that A1 is the deuterated um, structure that we worked out earlier, uh, where the deuterium atoms, both of them, ended up on the CH3, so they replaced two of the hydrons in CH3. So reacting that with um, D2 deuteration, uh, that would give that possible structure. However, they want a pair of enantiomers, so you have to work out which carbon has four different groups coming off of it, and then you can work out what the two um, non-superimposable mirror images are. So looking at the carbons here, it seems to, uh, quite clear that the one in the middle would be the one that has uh, four different groups coming off it. So that means we can have two different possible enantiomers that still represent that same compound. So if we're going on to part I, What this means, uh, where it says compounds A2 and A3 also form the compounds X1 and X2 on deuteration. If you remember, A2 and A3 are two of the other deuterated isomers of A. In other words, there are two deuter deuterium atoms somewhere in the molecule. 
the idea here is that you are to work out what other possible structures might have led to x1 and x2 when deuterated, so you're thinking backwards. So what you want is something that would have led to those two structures that we talked about a moment ago, but with the second deuterium placed somewhere else. So having a little think about it, the only two possible candidates for A2 and A3 would be these two here. So taking this idea a step further, it says uh, A4 and A5 give the same single compound Y on deuteration. So you need to draw the structure of Y and uh, then draw the structures of A4 and A5. You don't have to say which one is which. But uh, you need to remember that because they form the same compound when deuterated, the D atoms currently on A4 and A5 must be in the same structural positions. In other words, all the D atoms must be added across the carbon-carbon double bond. So that's our structure of Y. Now to get that structure, you need to think backwards to what um, deuterated isomers of A would lead to it. So those are the two possible structures you could get. It doesn't really matter which way around you draw them in your, um, in your answer booklet. So then uh, A6 forms the single compound Z on deuteration. It says draw the structures of A6 and of Z. So the only way that that could work is for the deuterium atom, um, the second deuterium atom rather, in addition to the one on the CH3, um, to be placed on the same carbon that the CH3 is coming off. Or should I say, say the CH2D uh, D group is coming off. I've just made my point there a little clumsily, so I've illustrated it a bit there. Okay, so the next um, part of the question. So this next question requires a little bit of thinking backwards. Going back to X1 and X2 from part H, remember to pause and rewind the clip a little bit just to remind yourself. X1 and X2 were formed from deuteration across the carbon-carbon double bond, where two deuterium atoms that were already there were on the CH3. So in other words, you'd have CHD2. So if this time the enantiomers have to be different from X1 and X2, the two D atoms in the original um, isomer that forms them uh, need to be in different environments from those in A1. So I'm putting the D um, atoms in a different place for A7. So the two enantiomers you don't have to actually draw out. I've put them there just to illustrate. So this next final part is about um, symmetry. So you need to do a little bit of visualising here. So if there's no plane of symmetry and no rotational symmetry, uh, you'll need to put it in the top left box. If there is a plane of symmetry but no rotational symmetry, you put it in the top right box. If you have no plane of symmetry but rotational symmetry, you put it in the bottom left. If you've got plane of symmetry and rotational, you put it in the bottom right. So you can use the little um, figures that they've drawn to help you um, sort of visualise what's going on here. So what I'm going to do now is uh, divide my, um, <clears throat> my table into four pieces, into four sections. I've got section one, two, three, and four as per the diagrams. So for the first one, there's no isomers in this particular category. Um, but uh, if you look at uh, the plane of symmetry category, um, but no rotational symmetry, you've got uh, cyclopropane with one, uh, sorry, with two deuterium, one on each side, pointing upwards. So two hydrogens are replaced by, with D in the top right hand corner. And there's a plane of symmetry down the middle, uh, so it, it, it has a plane of symmetry that it won't rotate. So if we now go down to um, part three, you've got uh, D pointing in opposite directions, so the same isomer, but the D is pointing in opposite directions at each side. And for part four, you've got the D coming off, or two Ds coming off the one carbon atom. So they're all based on cyclopropane, 
uh, but in part four you have um, a rotational plane and you uh, don't have, uh, sorry, you do have a plane of symmetry as well. Okay, so that takes us to the end of this particular clip and uh, as always, thank you very much for listening and until next time, see you soon.